What a week. <laughs> Wild and wooly in college football as a whole, and the Big Ten really front and center in all this. It's really been exciting. This Iowa team once again had an opportunity to, to show that they are a dominant program. How about Michigan State and what they're doing at this particular point? I think we're just learning how hard it is to not lose games in college football this year. <laughs> I mean, when you see Alabama go down... I, I think everybody else is appreciating their, uh, their zero in the loss total a little more in the Big Ten. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, that was a game that very few people gave Texas A&M any chance in. And again, I think it just speaks to, we've talked about it a lot here these last few weeks, what an unusual year this is in college football. Those 2007 parallels continue yeah. to be drawn, and you can understand why. Let, let's focus on the Big Ten first, and we'll get to the national picture in just a minute. But we look at our big story, and as it is, Every week on a Monday, it's what happened in the Big Ten. The top four showdown at Kinnick that Nicole was at went to the Hawkeyes, rallying from 14 down to win it. A game that really turned on the injury to Penn State QB Sean Clifford. Ohio State, Michigan State, both with convincing wins and unbeaten Michigan, overcoming a fourth-quarter deficit to win at Nebraska. We're going to dive deeper into all those games, really put each one of them under the microscope here coming up in the next hour, but at first blush, big picture takeaway on the Big Ten's week that was. It was strong. Uh, to me, I, I look at Ohio State and what they were able to accomplish. We've talked about Michigan State and them, but it, it really, these teams are really raising their level of play, and Michigan is kind of just sitting there, kind of getting better every week, so I like where they're going. I think a lot of it's going to ultimately just settle itself because they have to play one another, but this is going to be fascinating. That's what That was one of my main takeaways. I mean, we talked a lot about um, Iowa-Penn State all week, right, and, and just what a monster game it was, and it lived up to it. It was an incredible atmosphere. I was in the middle of the field storm at the end of the day. Like, <laughs> it was very sweaty, I would just like to say. Um, but the cool part about Penn State, and we, and we need to obviously know if Sean Clifford's okay, if he's going to come back, but you knew that they're going to have all these other opportunities. And, and you knew watching Michigan, watching Michigan State throughout the day, all these teams are going to play each other. And so that's really enticing. And I think that that is what made that game so important for Iowa, obviously. Yeah. But that was one of my main takeaways, too, is that I love that all of these teams are playing better, playing well, getting better week to week, and we still have all of these games down the road. And I think it's also interesting from a national perspective that people have so much respect for Penn State and knowing yeah. that the quarterback went out. And I was wondering where, where – the, the voters would put them, but to still have them in the top 10, I think is very significant. That, that's, and that I think you had to do. I mean, obviously you would have liked more clarity on what the injury is and how long, you know, what the early prognosis is. But I think based on what we've seen, what we've seen from the defense and how valuable Sean Clifford is, right? If he does come back, okay. You, you'd have to, you have to consider them still as a top 10 program and a top 10 team right now. So, yes, I think that does speak to the, the, the way that the national perception has shifted because we've seen this with the SEC, right? Like an SEC team beats a top 10 team and then they bump into the top 10 instead of being like, well, maybe that team wasn't yeah. as good. And we see every other conference gets that, right? Mm -hmm. Like ACC, Big Ten, everyone's like, well, maybe that team wasn't as good. Finally, the Big Ten is like, you know what? They had a key injury. We still think that's a really good team. We're not going to penalize them that much for a loss like that. Interesting that you guys are talking about the rankings. Let's go there. I appreciate the segue. And you take a look at them, and looky here. Five Big Ten teams in the top ten. That is the first time that has ever happened in the history of the poll that wow. dates back to the mid-1930s. Iowa is now up to number two, highest ranking for them since 1985. Ohio State, as you can see, is six. And you guys mentioned Penn State just moving down to seven. Michigan State rounding out the top ten there. So, again, Iowa, Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan, and Michigan State all in the top ten. Nicole, is this the best conference in the country? Right now, yeah, absolutely. And we, we've started to have this conversation of who is best positioned for two playoff teams, right? And, you know, you still – I don't want to count out Alabama. We, did, we saw they didn't fall that much, by the way. Uh, they went out there obviously in – I mean, you know, the SEC is still going to be well positioned with Georgia and Alabama on a crash course here. But the Big Ten is too. And you talk about all of these teams in the East, so, so they're going to beat up on each other for sure. But you could have an undefeated Iowa heading into a Big Ten championship game. 
You also could have a really good team that loses one game in the East and is just sitting out there as potential playoff teams. So, yeah, I think absolutely. We're seeing how hard it is to be consistent on a weekly basis in college football this year. And you have more consistency in this league than you do anywhere else. Yeah, I think when you look at the East right now, I think it's, it's, it's tough not to argue that that's the best division. Yeah. But then all of a sudden you have Iowa on the other side that's just playing lights out right now. And you start to put them all together and you look up and down and you're like, this is a really solid conference right now. And the way these coaches are coaching, the players are playing at a high level. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fun as we continue to move through the season. As you mentioned, everything ultimately works itself out. But right now to be in this type of position – for Big Ten fans, for, for teams that are part of being in the top ten, their fan base has got to be excited. There are two sides to that coin, of course, and you guys have pointed it out. I mean, the Big Ten East is so strong, and all these teams still have to play each other. And, you know, by the way, we're going to have a massive weekend starting October 30th yes. where we have all four of them going head-to-head with Michigan playing Michigan State and Penn State playing Ohio State, but then continuing into November. Mm-hmm. It, it seems like every week we're going to have one of these showdowns There's two sides to it. I mean, you have the possibility of one team kind of running all the way through it. Mm -hmm. You also have the possibility of them just kind of picking one another off. But it's a nice problem to have. And then, of course, if kind of to your point earlier, Nicole, if the Big Ten is perceived to be as good as it is, which I I think it's pretty clear the national perception is how that the league is really good, then one loss doesn't hurt you. But then you start to get into this equation of how many can you afford to lose. Well, and this is a year, right? We we haven't seen a two-loss team make the playoff, but this feels like it's there's all of these top teams have flaws, and we've seen Alabama go down. We've seen Ohio State suffer a loss. Oregon's still in that top ten. They have a loss. So it feels like it's going to be that year where you're going to see two lost teams get consideration that they haven't in the past. And I think that's a good thing. I, it's one of the reasons that I, I've always kind of been a proponent of playoff expansion. Mm-hmm. I, I think the wiggle room, it incentivizes better scheduling. The wiggle room is helpful. Um, and, and teams are allowed to get better throughout the season. <laughs> like we're seeing Ohio right. State get better, right? Like we're allowed to do that and you're allowed to view that team differently. Um, but yeah, it's going to matter who you lose to and how you lose when you play them. Because right now, Penn State, let's say Sean Clifford, comes back, is healthy. Penn State runs through that East. Their schedule's been so brutal. We, we'd have so much respect for them. They would get a, it. It would be discounted that they lost a game without their starting quarterback. This is something that the playoff committee pays attention to. I've done the mock selection. They talk mm-hmm. about that. Player availability is a big deal, especially starting quarterback. And especially if you watch that game, how the offense just stalled out without him. So if he comes back, they're going to be able to discount that loss. It won't count the way that it would for anyone else at full strength. And they had a number of other injuries in that Mm -hmm. game too. But all of that stuff plays into the how you lost and how many teams you lost too. I think the other fascinating angle, and you mentioned the committee, as we continue to to move toward that first week of November, that it's going to be interesting to see just where these teams are, where they stack up in the committee's eyes. And because we've seen before that, there's a certain way that everyone else votes teams, and then once you get to the committee, they vote a certain way. But I think all of these Big Ten teams right now position really, really well. How does Alabama's loss, in your eyes, Nicole, impact the Big Ten? Well, I think it definitely keeps that idea of two teams alive. And, you know, it's great for Cincinnati as well, as we saw them slide up in the rankings. They're ahead of Alabama in the AP poll. Um, but, but what it does is it is – getting rid of some of that expectation that the SEC will for sure get two teams in. And I I think, you know, you still certainly have that possibility. Alabama wins out um, and Georgia's only lost to Alabama. We're still going to have that conversation. But again, we've not had a two loss team make this thing. We've had Alabama's made it as a one loss non-champion, just like Ohio State has. Mm -hmm. We've seen certain teams get certain treatment, but not only does it show, you know, does it just like adding to the loss column affect the way that the playoff picture goes and even how the SEC race shakes out, it also shows that they're flawed too. And I think that that's something that's important in this era of uh, this season in college football because everybody has that. And to not have like a super team or someone that we just totally buy into, that they're bulletproof, that they're just for sure going to be like the number one seed in the playoff, I think is helpful for everybody else who wants to stay in this race, even with their own flaws, because we're going to talk about them. The the Big Ten teams have flaws, too. But everybody does this year. And so that helps everyone else, and especially, like we said, the Big Ten, either the the team like an Iowa that loses in the championship game or the second-place team in the East. Those teams are going to be in the mix, depending on how this all shakes out. This could be a very interesting 
a couple of weekends that they have to spend in there. But I think Cincinnati really benefits from a team like Alabama losing. I think Alabama still makes the playoffs if they run the table. But now all of a sudden, what do you do with Cincinnati? And we'll probably get a good sense of that once the first week of the college football playoffs. And it's easy still to envision, although no one envisioned Alabama losing to Texas A&M. I think when you look at their schedule, they still have Arkansas on their schedule. Obviously, LSU it does not appear to be a no. threat to them. They have to go to Auburn, yeah. and it's a rivalry game. It's always a big game, but, I mean, you certainly could envision a scenario where they go the rest of the way and Georgia's mm-hmm. undefeated, and as you say, they play in the SEC championship game. So by no means does it eliminate them, but you kind of hinted at it, Nicole. There's still the possibility of, of two Big Ten teams, and – and I think that's what's really exciting for Big Ten fans as well. As you go, it's so different. And we talked about this Saturday on Tailgate, where it's such a different scenario than kind of these past years, where, with the exception of the year that Michigan State made it, there's been a lot of times where it's felt like Ohio State or bust for yeah. the Big Ten. And it feels very different this year because you could make an argument that all of these teams are in the playoff picture. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Every single one. There's there's not like a, well, convoluted path that you'd have to, well, this would need to happen. No. no. Take care of your own business. Go You're win. there. You're there. Yeah, right? it, is, it is incredibly straightforward. If people don't want to talk about Michigan or Michigan State as a playoff team, well, you're going to have to wait until they lose because right now their path is clear and Iowa's path is clear. We can talk about the offensive limitations, and we will, but their paths are clear right now. And, and that's what's crazy. I think right now you're looking at – we're still looking at a world where the SEC could get two teams in. Looking at a world the Big Ten could get two teams. If those two conferences have all four spots in the playoff, by the way, we'll start talking about expansion <laughs> sooner. But also Cincinnati, right? right. Like, like these are, it's just, it's so different and refreshing. And I think that that's actually my favorite part of this season so far is that we're talking about all of these programs that we haven't gotten to talk about at that level having yeah. paths and we're into October. I know it's still early. We're not at the halfway point, but we haven't been able to have these conversations sure. in how many years? A long time. No, no. It, yeah. it just felt like kind of a fate accompli on a lot of these teams where you come into the year and well, three of the four spots are already spoken Every for. Every year. And you're playing for one of them. Yes. You and know it, what's also interesting? Yeah. See, I mean, cut you off, but What's also interesting is that normally if you get to you get teams into their championship game, Big Ten championship, the West, the East, right? Uh, sometimes the, the, the team that doesn't make it in the East, the, t- the number two team ends up getting that spot right. in the playoffs. This year, the way these teams are playing, let's say Iowa loses a tight game if they are if they're there. They still make the playoffs, I would think, the way they've been playing. Depending on what's going exactly on around right. it, right? Yeah, I mean, so a lot of that, in the yeah. vacuum. But exactly, yeah. but that's, yeah. to me, that's what's really interesting. And you talk about just having to play the games. Yeah, you do the pass or, or right in front of them, you, go, you just have to go out and win out. But still, to me, it's always interesting, that number two team, that number three team, where are they positioned as far as the committee is concerned? And, and one thing that is also not true every year, but this is where like the top 10 rankings and everything really comes into play, is now all of those games are monster games and big resume boosters, whereas certain years, like the ACC's problem right now is that the, the whole league is down. So even an undefeated Wake Forest isn't having opportunities to build mm-hmm. their resume where all of these Big Ten teams will and should because these teams aren't going to fall off, right? So you're still going to have top 25 wins, things that the committee counts, top 10 wins, mm. all these opportunities. That is going to pay dividends. Even if the committee decides that some of these teams aren't as good as we think they are right now, still going to be top 25 wins, top 15, top 20 wins. You never wish the time away <laughs> because every week is fun. I mean, right. that's the, the beauty of college football. But, man, starting October 30th, I yeah. mean, it is going to be wild. Every weekend is going to be wild. It, it, it will really be something. What a scene Saturday night in Iowa City. The Hawkeyes rallying to top the Nittany Lions 23-20. Their 12th straight win. Just the fifth time in school history. They've won a dozen in a row. Their fifth win in their last six home games against AP Top 5 teams setting off this massive celebration of kidding. Nicole's down in there somewhere. I, I was. <laughs> now 6-0 and on the year as they prepare to host Purdue this week. Let's start with Iowa. Nicole, since you were there, we'll give you the first word on this game. What did we learn about the Hawkeyes? We learned that they are very comfortable winning games in ways that are maybe uncomfortable to watch, actually. <laughs> Defense and special yeah. teams. Uh, th- this fan base loves their punter. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's I don't really blame him. I love him, too. Oh, I mean, he is, he is great. He is phenomenal. But, like, 
you can tell by the way that the fans cheer that they totally buy into where their strengths are. Like, you know, they see what we see and they love the takeaways. Who wouldn't? They love the punting and the field position yeah. battles. And they're comfortable winning games that way. And Kirk Ferentz was talking about that. That's just how he's been wired. And that's how Iowa has been. So, so quintessentially Iowa. And what it did in this game was it gave them a, posi- a chance at the end, right? Obviously, Penn State losing Sean Clifford impacted this game, but it put them in a position to, to win the game with one drive at the end. And, and maybe Kirk thought that maybe they were going to need two field goals there because maybe they weren't going to be able to score a touchdown. But this is how the team is built and how they win games, and, they, and, and they're okay with that. They, they see their offensive limitations. It, they, they view it as a complete football team and, and complementary pieces, and they're good with that. That's who they are. And yeah, they, I, yeah, I think they're better than okay with it, right? I think they yeah. embrace they, it. They, right? they, they yeah. do. Yeah. They do. And I don't mean to say it in a negative way. It's just no. I love that they know who they are and are like, cool, we're good with it. Like, I'm cheering. Like, they've got the offensive players cheering for the defense when they're on the sidelines and, and pulling for stops and tackles. And, like, that's awesome. I just think that's really cool in this era of college football where there's so many flashy offenses and um, highlight reels and stuff. Like, their stuff is all defensive and, and great punt coverage. That's what they wanted to talk about after yeah. the game. Which, which is good. I mean, you talk about the consistency. That's ultimately just who they are. But I remember last week when we were talking about getting ready for this game and, you know, it would be on the quarterbacks because this defense was going to play at such a high level. And, and they continue to do it. They continue to, to slow offenses down and force them to just hesitate just a little bit. They're able to create pressure on quarterbacks. And you talk about the special teams game. When you can flip the field with a defense like this, it's perfect. I mean, it's not always going to be as flashy as we would like it to be offensively. And I think it's us, right? We yeah. talked about it's, it's just us. Yeah. We want to see how, you know, 70 yard passes, 75 yard run. We want to see all those things. But as you mentioned, for them to embrace who they are and understand who they are means that they play inside of what their system is. And that game may change from week to week of the game plan offensively, where Coach Ferentz has to be more creative to get them the football in positions or create mismatches. They're finding a way to do it. There are only three teams in the country that have punted more than Iowa. And you look at the three in front of them, they're all bad. (laughs) So it's not like this is um, some formula for winning college football games. It's not. Generally, when you punt more, you're not very good. But but field position, like their field position advantage in that game was plus 19, average starting field position. 19 yards on average, better field position than Penn State had. It is those hidden yards, and they don't turn the ball over. They don't make mistakes. They turn the opponent over a ton, and and this is what you get. Yeah, and and you'd like to see them when they – get the ball off a turnover in the red zone. You'd like to see them score a touchdown, right? Like these these are where they need to grow and and things that they need to do to take that next step. But you're right. I mean, the defense and special teams are putting them in great position. And and that's what you mean when you say you're a complete team, when you care about all three phases, it's it's that. Um, And and one stat that was just jumped out to me, I told Howard this before the show because I couldn't believe it was real. Iowa has intercepted 7.1% of the passes thrown against it this year in the national average is 2.7 so it is like what they are doing is historic and they're not always capitalized right sometimes depending on where the interception is Mm -hmm. or you know what the offense does afterwards but they are ending possessions for their other teams and this is just a mind-boggling number and we kept saying early in the season at some point they're not going to do this right but now I'm just all in they're just going to do it every week And, and you look at I mean Penn State had three turnovers all year coming into this game and they had four in this one now part of it is the backup quarterback and and we'll get to that but two of them were when Sean Clifford was in the game Howard I mean yeah absolutely first first pass of the game under duress yeah trying to make a play and it wasn't there Right. It, it clearly wasn't there, and he would want it back. But when you're in your own zen, end zone and you're trying to get out there, things happen. And that's what this team has just been so great at doing. And it's really about the, the whole and not just parts. It's about absolutely the whole because I like to go to the recruiting rankings. Right? There's nothing in the recruiting rankings that say that they should be playing at this type of level. Right? Nothing there. But the coaching and the commitment that these players have toward one another – shows up on the field and is ultimately about having the best team you can put together. Well, oh, they've always been a great developmental program, and not just developing great college players, but, of course, they put a ton of guys <laughs> yes. in the NFL as well. Before we leave Iowa, and I do want to get to Penn State, 
Is the offense good enough? I mean, I, I think it kind of goes back to what you were saying, Nicole, kind of this notion of, well, is this sustainable, right? C can you do this? We came into this week and we didn't necessarily think it was. Is this offense good enough, Howard, knowing now what we know about the defense, knowing what we know about special teams, and knowing what we know, frankly, about the schedule? Yeah. Uh, they've played some of their most challenging games already, which isn't to say Wisconsin won't be a tough game, rivalry game. Nebraska's getting better, although they, mm -hmm. they don't seem to be able to pull it out against yeah. good teams. But, but certainly their road is not nearly as tough as all those teams in the East going forward. What I see with this Iowa offense is they do enough each week to show you that they can get better. And that's where they're heading. Um, do they have enough historically when we look at a 14 playoff? The immediate answer would be no. But the reality is this is a much different year. So you don't have these high-flying offenses out, outside of a, you know, Ohio State is, is there. We'll get to them. But they're not out there right now. So this Iowa team can be in great position to do what they need to do. All you need to do is get in the game. I mean, that's the reality. Can you just get to a, get the championship game and you have an opportunity? It'll be close. Wherever oh, they yeah. play, I mean, yeah, yeah. it'll be close, yeah. right? But, like but, a, but that's the blowout. thing. It may not matter until the championship yeah, game. It right. may not matter until there's a college football playoff situation because yeah. they, they are beating Big Ten teams this way. They're scoring mm -hmm. one more point than everybody else, right? And, and Spencer Peters was talking about this after the game about having to be patient when things are not working. Like, the first quarter was, was not good. He was, he was struggling. And if you're patient and not making mistakes, then you're probably going to be in the game and put yourself in position yeah. to win it. Maybe you're going to get some points off your turnovers directly. Maybe there will be some pick sixes. But, yeah, I mean, I, I'm definitely concerned. It's clear that, this, that the offense is going to be the limiting factor for this program. I just don't think it's going to matter until yeah. Indianapolis. So, so we're going to go through a phase here where they are going to try to get better. They're going to mm -hmm. try to learn some things. I think Tyler Goodson should get the ball more. I think he's a really good running back. Um, I, I would let him do some stuff stuff get him the ball in space mm -hmm. we saw we saw that work yeah. but I just don't think that this is going to be something that will we're, we're going to necessarily decide if we trust it or don't trust it until we see them against the team in the east and by the way is Kurt fans look any happier in a post-game <laughs> press well, conference yeah I mean we saw was, on this it, 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 so it was happy. great yeah and the, lo the locker room was fantastic so emotional right? yes. so yeah. giddy yeah they're they're enjoying this yeah. absolutely as well they should they had a really tough summer a couple summers ago they kind of rallied the troops, and, and I we talked about this the other day where you know, Kirk said, hey, if it's me, if I'm the problem, I'm, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. it's, it's fine. You tell me. And, and so I think that they really have done a lot of soul searching as a program, and to get to this point is probably that much yeah. more gratifying. This game did turn on Clifford's injury. There's no question about it. That doesn't take anything away from what Iowa accomplished. But this was a very different Penn State team once Clifford went out. I mean, here's what you – you see the numbers, three points after his injury. The yardage total was cut in half. They managed to throw for just 34 yards. And when you struggle to run it the way they do, and they have struggled with that all year, quarterback health is vital. It's unclear what the extent of Clifford's injury is. As, as you mentioned, Nicole, maybe we'll find out more this week. Maybe we won't, frankly, with Penn State on a bye. Howard, I don't think what happened with Roberson surprises us necessarily no. after we were at camp. He didn't have a great no. day. When we were there, and again, that's not uh, it, it not meant to be a, any kind of a personal attack or whatever. Right. Just the reality was you looked at it and said, man, they may be in trouble mm -hmm. if Clifford were to get hurt. And they found themselves in trouble because you also wonder how many reps is your backup quarterback getting throughout the week. In season, yeah. Yeah, it's difficult. So having Clifford out there obviously gives them the best chance. So I wonder just over the next couple of weeks, do, do you start to have a, another package because I think where he can help you more is in the run game right now. He can probably get the run game going a little bit better than maybe Clifford can. So now I think you, you may have a team with two slightly different offenses because you're going to now, you would tailor it depending upon how long the injury is. You would start to tail, tailor your offense towards your backup now and to put him in a position where he can have some success. And I wouldn't be surprised if he did. But I think you have to be able to tweak the offense, and I think they're smart enough to be able to do that if needed. You know, one other area that I think just getting reps as the number one guy or, or knowing that you're going to need to play, even if Clifford comes back, but is, is limited, is, is the, the snap count and the false starts. I mean, it was eight, eight right? False eight, starts. eight false yeah. starts. Yeah. 
I've never seen it. There were three in a row with three different linemen. Yeah. And obviously it was an incredibly difficult situation to walk into as the mm -hmm. backup quarterback. Also, all those false starts were deep in Penn State's territory. But that's got to be shored up mm -hmm. because if you're trying to alleviate any pressure yeah. you can on the backup guy and tr maybe getting to use his legs, yeah. all of these things, you cannot make mistakes and shoot yourself in the foot like that. And that was a huge problem as well and also spoke to just the m massive drop-off on just basic yeah. Basic elements of the Penn State offense. So the game totally changed. There's there's no other way to say that. And I know Penn State fans are are out there saying it would have been different if Sean Clifford was in. It, it would have. It yeah. would have. Um, but now the question is, do you get him back this season? And and can you get him to 100 percent if he does come back? I mean, there's just that's where that's where you are. You can't go back and take away the second half of this game. Here's where it's fascinating to me. This is the transfer portal. Now you are seeing the impact because Will Levis was a tremendous backup. Remember, Sean Clifford yeah. was benched briefly yeah. last year. Levis got a start. Levis is 6-0 and at Kentucky. I mean, but he had the ability to go and transfer and play right away. Yeah. If you didn't have that, maybe yeah. he would have stayed at Penn State and been the backup. And so it shows you, I think, how difficult it is to convince kids to kind of play that role. And again, that's not a value statement in any way. It's just saying that the equation has changed now in college football. And so there probably aren't that many teams, frankly, that have a backup that they feel great about. Quarterback injuries are very much a part of the game, particularly in this era of more mobile quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. But wow, I mean, front and center now, you understand the value of the backup. You've got to have a backup that can, can help you. And, and as we toured this summer, we saw that they're, they're not the only place that no. may have had some challenges at, at that position. But then you look at a place, and I know we're not talking about Michigan right now, but I wanted to bring Michigan up because they do have a backup quarterback that, to me, is going to be unbelievable once he gets full control of this offense. And just to interject there, I, I do want you to, to go a little further on McCarthy, but they even have Alan Bowman, right? They have a third-string guy who was a Power 5 starter, yeah. Howard. Like, very <laughs> few people have a situation like that. And it's hard. And I'm telling you, it's just hard to be able to be in a position – to keep as many quarterbacks as happy as you need to be. And then we look at Ohio State. And they've got a whole room full of them. Well, but well, how long will they have that room? Well, they got the room now. Yes. And, right? and, and that's kind of like the question of experience as well, right? Like Michigan, the guys you're talking about, they've worked into games where yeah. Alan Bowman came with experience. Like this is why when I'm watching the Red River game and Oklahoma benches Spencer Rattler, right. but they have a guy, they have their next guy. He yeah. was always going to be the next guy. But he, he leads them to the comeback, and he's probably going to be the starter. How many how many places have that? Right? Yeah. It's just the couple that you've mentioned yeah. here. There is a massive drop-off at a lot of places. Like, we've talked about this with Wisconsin, right, when Graham Mertz got injured or even when he wasn't playing well. Yeah. The drop-off, right? And so you have this with places that can't keep the depth because of the transfer portal because this is the one position it's really hard to play to. And, and now you're seeing it's the most valuable, like, did, did Sean Clifford not just show us that he was maybe the most valuable player in the country yeah. because of how they changed when he was out? But it's so hard to keep guys just in case in this era of football. So what Oklahoma did is rare. Yeah. That's not going to be possible in a lot of places with the backup. True freshman at Oklahoma yeah. stepped in. Right. So you got to be able to get the guy. That's what it is, right? And this is the same thing in Michigan, right? Yeah. It's, it's yeah. J.J. McCarthy. So, mm -hmm. so if you have convinced someone that they are the heir apparent and they're that good, they're ready to go right away in an emergency. That's probably the best case scenario. And, and they're Recruit, okay. They lost yes. the battle yes. right then, yes. that yeah. year. That's yeah. okay, but they're not going to leave immediately. Right. But if you were Caleb Williams, there. you came in and you knew Spencer Rattler was probably one year going to be ahead of you for a year. Yes. Right. If you were J.J. McCarthy, you probably knew you weren't going to be the starter. But you feel good enough about where you are and about yeah. where things are in the medium term that, okay, maybe I'll, I'll get my opportunities. But it's, man, it is a delicate balance there. Ohio State still perfect in conference play after blowing out Maryland 66-17. to Bucks rolled up nearly 600 yards of offense. Second straight week, C.J. Stroud has thrown for five TDs. It's their third straight game scoring 50 or more points. Just the third time they've done that in school history. Again, at Howard, not necessarily the best opposition, but still pretty impressive to do what they have done on that side of the football. Yeah, and I really think ultimately it starts with the quarterback position. He, he to me, looks so comfortable right now uh, running that offense, and it looks like his time away uh, really has slowed the game down. He's confident. 
And the reality is that he has so many, not good, great yeah. players yes. around him that it's not all on him. Yeah, you still have to make the right decisions, but when you have first-rounders at the wide receiver position, a future first-rounder behind you, yeah. and yeah. some first-rounders probably in that offensive line, this team is starting to get right exactly where they want to be. You know, we were talking about this earlier about, like, this year maybe there isn't a consistent, explosive, reliable, great offense. I mean, Ohio State could certainly be that. And, and I think that that's what's really interesting as we talk about all these top teams and you look at the rankings, and they're all great defensive teams, what that would look like against an Ohio State offense um, and an improving defense, right? Like, that's obviously part of what's happening here. But when this offense is firing on all cylinders, it does look different than the other top teams that we're seeing in this country. Yeah, it's interesting. I talked last week about the things that I do on my Sundays. and uh, that they, Oh, we got some nuggets yeah, coming, yeah, Nicole. They, we they got some nuggets. Uh, you know, somewhat <laughs> pathetically uh, diving and pouring through statistics. They not only lead the power five in yards per play, but the gap is 1.2 yards wow. per play. That is the same as the gap between the second place team and the 31st place team. The gap between one and two. So it tells you how much better they are. And again, some people might say, well, they haven't played quite the same opposition, and, and that, that's fine. I mean, we'll find out here, I think, going forward when we get into that round robin that we've been talking about. But it's clear this offense is fabulous, and it's clear it does revolve around the confidence of C.J. Stroud, and it's kind of absurd that we were hearing people a couple weeks ago talk about, well, is he the right guy? Right. I mean, well, they were saying that week one, when he hadn't started a game, hadn't played in college yeah. yet. Yeah. And that's, that's what happens. It's just what right? it is, it's, right? It's, it's just what it is. Okay, so, so the real question <laughs> is not, is C.J. Stroud the right guy? The real question is, is the defense good enough? And, and we've talked about this a lot. This notion of, and he, you know, Nick Saban has acknowledged this. I think, like, it used to be that you felt like defense won championships, right? That was the old adage. I don't think that's as true in this day and age. Yeah. You can't be horrible defensively. Mm -hmm. But Ohio State did not have a very good defensive team by national standards last year, certainly not by national championship standards, mm -hmm. and they were one game away from winning the national championship. So the question, I think, is are you good enough on defense? And these last couple weeks have made me feel like maybe they are. Yeah, I think they are when you have an offense that's firing all cylinders the way this one is. I think the defense will be. And there's some truth to defenses on ultimately win championships, but I think they get you to the championships or to the playoffs, and you need a defense to be able to do that. But... Once that happens, now all bets are off because I think the number is somewhere around 40-plus points you need to be scoring. Those four teams need to score to be able to win and to be in that situation. And Ohio State is well on their way to doing that. It, it reminds me of the conversation around LSU in 2019 because we were so enamored by the offense and Joe Burrow, and we see those guys playing on Sundays now. But the defense was great. And they had a couple of high score. They had, there was, you know, the, Joe Burrow had to win them a couple of games, right? But the defense is what, what can get them there, as you said, Howard, and, and can be good enough. And, and they were elite on both sides. But we have seen teams in the playoff era that have not necessarily been elite on both sides. But that's where Saban changed his philosophy, right? He realized you have to get to 40 points. You have to be able to win games yeah. that way as well. And again, this is an Alabama team that's maybe not as great defensively as they usually are or offensively as they usually are. So, so that's where it, what makes this season, I think, really interesting and what has given Ohio State time to get this stuff right. And the way that the schedule fell for them is also pretty great because they're going to play all those teams in the East <laughs> we've been talking about. But they still got a couple more weeks to get ready for that. And, like, obviously against Michigan State's offense, for example, they're going to need to be a lot better than they played against Oregon. But you know what? They will have had time to grow and to try different things and figure some stuff out. And so we'll, we'll learn. We'll learn. But I just don't think you have to be perfect on either side of the ball this season. And they've been a lot better. I mean, the last two opponents, Big Ten opponents, under 350 yards. So, again, you can win a lot of games that way. If Taking could, some interceptions back, yes, touchdowns yeah, yeah, as well. Defensive touchdowns yeah. every single yeah. one of these games. Walker, still on his feet. There he goes. Kenneth Walker. He's going to go all the way. 94 yards. What's impressive is right here. He's not finished. Let me put a little move that time. He waved goodbye to the Rutgers defense. He gave a five to Jalen Naylor <laughs> all before he got into the end zone. Welcome to the Explosive Play Club. Uh, explosive indeed. The longest play from scrimmage in Michigan State history. Wow. One of the highlights of a record-setting day for the Spartans Saturday in their win over Rutgers. 
They became just the fifth team in the history of major college football to have a 300-yard passer, a 200-yard receiver, and a 200-yard rusher in the same game. Jalen Naylor hit that 200-yard receiving mark in the first half. He had three touchdowns of 60 yards or longer. We've seen really good Michigan State teams. We've seen a Michigan State team make it to the college football playoff, as everyone is aware. But it's a very different model than I think we became used to under Mark D'Antonio. Even though they had some good offensive teams, Mm -hmm. you kind of thought of that identity as being defense first. It's not the case here, Howard. Not at all. It's offensive explosion is what we're seeing. And the name we didn't even see up there was Jalen Reed. And why that's important is because it seems like each and every week, they're adding new weapons. There's another guy that's having the opportunity to step up, and that's why this team has become so explosive, and they're really doing an unbelievable job. Yeah, I mean, I feel like week one we were like, all right, they can run the ball. They got a, they got a running back, and then you see the passing game and the evolution there, um, and, and they are – they are showing all these wrinkles. They are showing all these different ways they can win. feels like they're setting different offensive records every single week in the passing game, in the, in the run game, the longest play, you know, touchdown play. Like, all this stuff is just really encouraging and fun to watch. And it speaks to the level of athlete, I think, that we're seeing on this roster as well. And some of these guys were on this roster before Mel Tucker got there. But a guy like Kenneth Walker the third, is, is somebody he brought in. And the, the, the being able to plug and play in the right spots has just been – we talk about it every week, but it's so impressive to do that with transfers and guys that you bring in coming out of a COVID year that was so weird for everybody. And just to have the touch to be playing the guys in the right way and then have time to grow and add wrinkles and add – more and more guys into the mix. Yeah, this, this coaching staff has done a, a remarkable job at you know, getting players to where they need to be to get them to be as explosive on the weekends as, as possible. And, you know, the offensive line's playing really well. So you got to give a lot, of, a lot of credit to this coaching staff and what they've been able to do. Yeah, particularly because the offense was so down here at the end of the D'Antonio era. So they now have seven plays of 60 yards or longer. They had six in the last four years combined. So it's really, I mean, it's a dramatic overhaul. And as you said, Nicole, Walker's a big part of it. And one of the other interesting conversations in college football, the uncertainty of the college football playoff is is kind of front and center. But I think kind of an ancillary conversation is the uncertainty around the Heisman. I mean, the guy who was the preseason Heisman favorite was Spencer Rattler. And now we're talking about, is he going to go in the portal? I mean, he's not even the starting quarterback, probably for Oklahoma here going forward. So it just gives you a sense of kind of how up in the air this is. I don't think there's an obvious candidate stepping forward. Is Kenneth Walker a guy who could fill that void and and be the Heisman front runner? He's the lead rusher in the country by far. Why not? I mean, I don't really think there is a Heisman race right now. Not yet. I mean, you know, we're starting to talk about guys, but it's taken seven weeks to get to this point because the two front runners before the season were Spencer Rattler and Sam Howell. And We just talked about it. Rattler got benched in the biggest game of the year. Sam Howell's on a team that is probably the most disappointing team in the country in Mm -hmm. North Carolina. So where are you going to find guys? I had put together three. We do a straw poll at the Athletics, so you have to vote for three guys each week. I had Kenneth Walker in my top three. I also had C.J. Stroud, who, again, we were talking about. Fans were frustrated with week one, week two, whatever it might be. But now you're talking about, okay, who's rounding into form? Who is consistent on a week-in, week-out basis? And who are the teams we think are great? Because usually these Heisman contenders come from teams we think are really good all of that is coming up Kenneth Walker right now so why not put him in the race but I, I again I don't even know how how many t- people are in the race right now but if there is one he's in it just out of curiosity who else you have so CJ Stroud Kenneth Walker right? Desmond Ritter Oh, okay. Yeah. Cincinnati. Yeah, but kind of quarterback is, of a great mm-hmm. team. I think, exactly. I think this is going to be something that changes week to week. But Kenneth Walker's numbers are going to be there. They, they could be enough to get him to New York, regardless of how Michigan State does. And the team is winning. Yes. That's, that's the biggest thing. The team is winning, and he's in an offense that's going to run the football. You're, you're not going to tell Michigan State they're not going to run football uh, when they come out and play. Now, you may slow them down, but they're going to run it, and they've got a quarterback that's not making mistakes. Wide receiver group that's playing really well. Tight ends are playing well. So he's going to be there at the end. Well, it's not like you can really key on him. Because if you key on him, to your point, they're going to be thrown to Jaden Reed or they're going to be thrown to Jalen Naylor. It was incredible how many downfield shots they took in that first half. I mean, throwing balls 40, 50 yards in the air. And what happens? See that. Yeah, and what happens when you have such a dominant run game, you start bringing extra people to slow them down, one-on-one yeah. matchups on the outside. So you can't do it, yeah. right? Right, because otherwise, I mean, it's, it's pick your poison, and, and both of them are, are quite poisonous. The Michigan Wolverines still perfect after rallying to top Nebraska Saturday night in Lincoln, 32-29. 
was a game in which they trailed for the first time all season. Michigan now 6-0, and first time since 2016. They've got a bye this week, then face Northwestern before the big showdown with Michigan State the last Saturday in October. Nicole, this is a pretty good win in a tough environment. Yeah, I, I, like it, it's kind of the best case scenario, right? Like, you, you know, you, you had your backs against the wall. You did all these things. You trailed in the game. Your quarterback threw an interception. These things that you hadn't done yet. And you still got out of there with a win. You still figured things out enough and, and you got plenty to work on. But you get a road win in league play. And, and you really had to tough it out at the end. Incredible strip sack at the very end. Um, I, I, that's the best case scenario because your backs were against the wall. You learned something, but you also won. Going on the road, I think, is a big part of it, right? You, you go into hostile environments, you struggle with that in the past, and you kind of exercise some of those demons. And I think it, this is a team that continues to build confidence as this year goes on. And that's why, to me, I, I know they have, still have questions. We ask questions about their offense as well, defensively sometimes. But this is a team that just looks like they're continuing to get better and finding ways to win. And no, it's not always the flashiest, but this is a team that wants to run the ball as well. Yeah, and you go to Madison and Lincoln and win yeah. back-to-back weeks, and you can say what you want about both those programs, but we know what challenging places those are historically for opponents to win in, and they got victories in both of those places. And the fact that they are, yeah, they, you know, we saw those first few weeks they led the nation in rushing, mm -hmm. and then two straight weeks with just over 100 yards rushing. This is really good balance yeah. here, but it is the third straight week they've thrown for more yards than they've run for. So I think we've answered that question. Right, well, because the questions were, right, can they do this? It's all, this is how we do. We continue to move the goalposts yep. to the right. goal line because we want to see these teams get better. And, and, but they're doing it. They're finding ways to be creative, to make plays, and to, to change their offense or their defense up each week, and they're, they're stepping up and playing well. Yeah, and, and the defense continues to make big plays when they need to. So I, I think there's a lot to like about this team right now. And there's a lot of things that we've been saying, you know, how are they different from these other teams that we've had kind of a mirage in September about, right? And they are they are continuing to win. They are continuing to be a complete team and win in these hostile environments in these games that people thought they could lose this game to Nebraska, right? Like all these situations where we've seen them lose in the past, as you said, Howard, they're not doing that. So I think you are seeing that growth. We talk about it week in, week out. Harbaugh is loose. Like, yes. he feels good about what he's got. The confidence is in the coaching staff as well. So I'm excited for that Michigan-Michigan State game because we're going to learn a lot about both of those teams. Mm. Okay, here's what I'm going to say. They're 40-8 and eight under Harbaugh before November 1st, and they're 15-14 and 14 okay. after November 1st. So, again, I'm not in any way countering the notion that there's a lot to feel good about. Right. This could be different. But it could be the same. And and so we'll see. And it's a really difficult schedule and after November Now October 1st. gets built in. We continue to move the goalposts. It was just yeah. like, are they you know, always good in September? Now it's September and October. So. I'm just telling you no. the numbers. No, you can do whatever right. you want to do with the numbers. Number. Right. The numbers are what they are. Yep. But they had issues going on the road before. Yes. They have issues yes. with ranked opponents. So is this team starting to turn the corner? Yeah. I do want to take the minute or so we have left to talk a little bit about Nebraska. It's kind of a familiar yep. script for them. You could see how heartbroken Scott Frost was yeah. after this game. They really did play well. They had every opportunity to win, and yet kind of the same thing at the end. And, and I think what makes it even tougher is when, you're, when your best player makes mistakes. Yeah. Right? That, because you, you know you need him to be able to win these games. And you're fighting, you're trying to get more effort instead of just going down maybe and, and protecting the football. It gets knocked out, and, and you come away with a loss. And it's such a cliche, but I just keep thinking about it for Nebraska that, you know, good teams know how to win games and, and then bad teams, you know, you see this happen, right, where they just they, they, it feels like they find ways to lose. Um, and it's the same things. It's the turnovers, right? It's, it's the same issues week in and week out. And, and a team like a Michigan is finding ways to win, yeah. and they found a way to win that game. We go back a few years for Northwestern when they were struggling to win games, right? And I'm not saying that these two, they're two the same situations, but then all of a sudden they were always in these tight games and would lose, and then all of a sudden they turned Be it around. Became one of the best close right. game exact teams so in America. Nebraska needs to to Figure find that out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's it's tough to see. It's especially tough because of the respect like, we all have for yeah. Andrew Martinez and how heroically he plays in yeah. these games. Yeah. Right? He's yeah. he's their entire offense.